Good afternoon. Welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Nina Shea. I direct the Center for Religious Freedom. And I thank you for coming out today to hear a very interesting discussion from Dr. Amal Morogi. Um, we uh, saw uh, just a phenomenal catastrophe in Iraq this last summer. June 9th, ISIS invaded or took over uh, Mosul. And it was really the la beginning of the last chapter of um, biblical Christianity in Iraq. Uh, um, within the next few weeks, the entire Christian presence in Iraq proper was eradicated. Uh, the Christians who were there were the diehards. They were those who remained um, over centuries of um, during centuries of attacks and dwindling down, and then the last 10 years when they were being deliberately driven out um, under the cover of uh, a conflict and terror. 70 of their churches had been bombed. Their leaders, some of them had been assassinated. Um, thousands of them had been um, abducted and held for ransom. Um, so the 140,000 to 200,000 Christians who remained in Iraq in June 2014 were uh, the last of the Aramaic-speaking Christians who traced their own faith back to uh, doubting Thomas, Thomas the Apostle. Um, the, they are now, for the most part, shivering in nylon tents and unfinished buildings in Kurdistan. Um, they have lost all their property. They have um, lost their homes, their possessions. Uh, some of them have uh, lost their lives, but for the most part, um, they did um, uh, get away with their lives, but they've lost hope in a future in Iraq. Um, it is the ISIS takeover of Nineveh Plain and Mosul is different from the ISIS takeover of the Mosul Dam, where the dam can be reclaimed and recaptured and um, business can be as usual. Um, it will probably be years, we're told, um, by our president before um, ISIS is destroyed, um, before the Islamic State is dismantled, before uh, Mosul is um, taken back. And we can see, uh, you know, the, the town of Kobani in Syria has been under, in, in conflict now for three months. Um, and that is a town where the inhabitants are fighting for their lives um, with the help of U.S. airstrikes. And it's still um, a conflict going on in Kobani. Um, how much longer will the conflict go on in a place like Mosul, once it starts, that is? Um, where uh, a sizable number of the, where, where the ISIS uh, militants are entrenched, where Saddam Hussein's uh, generals are entrenched, and where a sizable portion of the population has adapted to life there and may even have benefited from um, the Christian's property and, um, and having uh, Sunni control. So um, we have, uh, barely recognize that this is the eradication of the Christian presence um, here in the United States. At the, I remember at the time when Mosul was taken over, the headlines in, the, in Washington were filled with um, major stories, story after story, of uh, corruption on the part of the Virginia governor. And there was, you know, some inner story, some little piece uh, noting that Mosul had been taken over. And there seems to be even less recognition that this is the end of a, of a peaceable civilization, the Christian civilization that's been there for uh, some two millennia. Um, it was only when President Obama announced the um, airstrikes against ISIS really did, um, did it, was there some registering um, here, particularly among the churches, but um, others that um, the Christian and the Yazidi uh, minorities were under extreme attack and um, and um, had been uh, chased out of their lands and living as basically stateless people in Kurdistan. 
So I will now introduce our speaker today. He's going to be speaking more about the situation, Dr. Amal Maragi. Uh, she is an Iraqi-born scholar. She comes, her family comes from Dohuk. Um, she has studied and gotten her PhD in Ghent, Belgium, in Oriental languages and cultures. She taught for several years, taught Arabic um, at Cambridge University in the UK. And then she left to start Aradin, which in Aramaic means Garden of Eden. And its purpose is to preserve um, the culture, the heritage, cultural heritage and languages of Middle Eastern minorities. And her particular focus, of course, now is the Aramaic speaking people of um, Iraq and Syria. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Amal Maroki. Do you want to hear? You can. Thank you, Nina, for inviting me, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here to share with me something that is very close to my heart, but also to. Um, yeah. yeah. Is it okay? Can you hear me now better? Yeah. Great. Um, so I'll start. Basically, what I'm going to do with you today, because we have uh, limited time, is that we'll go through, I mean, I'll give you some uh, introduction, a short introduction, and I will try to tell the story through a few pictures and images that I have here, hope, hoping that that will make it clearer what we are trying to do in Aradin. Uh, but let us start with this anecdote, which is really very typical, and it was two years ago when I was thinking about setting up um, Aradin, uh, I was at Cambridge, we were doing some, um, some training on how to use uh, Twitter in academia. So my partner who was there, you know, we started talking about what he was doing, he was a scientist, and I started telling him about my vision of starting a charity to, uh, pr to promote cultural dialogue and preserve cultural heritage in danger, and um, especially Christians in the Middle East. And he looked at me and he said, um, very calmly, but um, look, I really don't care about a church being bombed in Syria. That is the least of my worries. And I said, neither do I, and that is also the least of my worries. Because really, Christians don't need a church to pray. They can pray anywhere. And Catholics or Orthodox, they need only bread and wine, and they can celebrate Mass. Muslims don't need a mosque to go and pray. They can pray in any corner. And Jewish, for that matter, didn't need for 40 years any place to to pray and keep their faith because they were in the desert for 40 years and they kept the faith. But what that church is telling us is something more than just the religion of these people. That church is telling us something about the architecture, is telling us something about that community, something about that culture, art, their hopes, their fears, and everything that is and will be in that community. So this is what we have to worry about. And I told him that when the uh, uh, statue of Buddha in Bamiyan was destroyed, I am not a Buddhist and I couldn't care less about a Buddhist statue being destroyed, really. But what the Taliban did then, they touched something that belongs to humanity and not only to the Afghanis and to, to the Buddhists. And this is what we are trying to do in Aradin, is that just to say, let's, we are not talking here about religion, we are not talking here about group or any sectarian or political ideas, we are talking about something that really belongs to humanity. It's a culture that's in danger, and we have to do something to save that culture wherever it is. And when I'm talking here, and when I'm going to talk about Muslims, Christians, or Jews, I'm not talking in any political or religious uh, terms. I'm talking in cultural terms, because that is what we are trying to do. For me, politics divides sometimes, or most of the times, as you wish but culture unites, and this is what we are all doing, and this is what Aradin is trying to do, and also to bring attention to what we are losing. So really, if we look at the history of the Middle East, it has been characterized by political and social turmoil, which unleashed ethnic, religious persecution of Jewish and Christian populations, mainly. Um, ancient Jewish, community, Jewish communities were forced to emigrate mainly to Israel, um, while threat to Christian communities and now Yazidis, uh, still un is still unfolding and has led to mass immigration and unprecedented scale of forced displacement. Most Christian migrants now have settled and many more are still waiting to settle in North America, Canada, Australia, 
with large communities in, Europe con uh, in European countries, mainly Sweden, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. So if we look at the situation now in, um, in Iraq, uh, specifically, I'm going to, to talk more about Iraq, but of course, you know, like this can be applied to Syria and um, in a less extent to, or differently to, to Egypt and Lebanon. So superficially, the crisis in Iraq and Syria and the Middle East in general is political and sectarian. However, in actual fact, it's a crisis of culture. Basic virtues and absence of a culture of true freedom, openness, and trust. It's a culture that is based on what I call one man rule them all. It's like the, lo the Lord of the Ring. One ring rule them all, and this is one man rule them all. And you have one, you have to have a figurehead who is very strong and who has to rule the unruly masses and keep them in check. So the Middle East has been ruled by fear, and as long as that culture of fear and exclusion continues to exist, peace will be um, a mirage. To, if we want to understand what is happening today to especially Christian, uh, Christian communities in the Middle East, I'm talking about Christian communities in the Middle East because for me, it's really an indicator. So again, I'm calling them Christian communities because it's very difficult to say the Copts, the Maronites, the Assyrians, the Chaldeans, the, the Armenians, you know, like, so I'm not talking here in theological terms, but I'm just using an umbrella term for these communities. And of course, you know, like, um, one, one, and for me, it is really an indicator. The way that Christian communities are treated in the Middle East is an indicator how other minorities are going to be treated. And I was telling people this before, you know, uh, the Yazidis were attacked. And indeed, you know, like it was first the Yazidis. And I don't know if you hear or agree with that, but I've heard from some uh, Iraqi Jews I have been in touch with that they had this idea of after Saturday comes Sunday. And then for me, it is really after the Christians come other minorities. It is an indicator. If Christian communities in the Middle East, having, they are enjoying relative peace, you will see that other minorities will be enjoying relative peace. If Christian communities in the Middle East are targeted, you, have, you will be sure that other communities will follow soon. And what, what is the problem with the, with the Christian communities in the Middle East? Because we, we all know that um, let's say Muslims have not always been horrible there. They have been protecting Christians, and it's true they have been living there together. I think that what we have to know when we are talking about the Middle East, that um, the Middle East is a um, mosaic of different cultures. So it is, there is no homogeneous culture there. Christians, Jews, Muslims, Arabs, Assyrians, Chaldeans, Armenians, uh, Yazidis, Kurds have always been there and they are going to be there hopefully. Otherwise, it is not, it is not going to be a Middle East. And um, I, I just would like to, you know, like to highlight really what is the problem with the, uh, with the, with the Christian communities in the Middle East. Um, I couldn't find a better way of describing it than what Cardinal Eugene uh, Tisserand said 80 years ago and which was um, quoted and translated by David Wilmhurst in his uh, book, uh, the, the Martyr Church. Um, and he is talking about the Nestorian Christians. Again, this is an umbrella term you, um, he's using for all the uh, Aramaic speaking Christians. And um, so this is what he said, this is how it goes. After I um, quote, after the Arab conquest throughout the, the lands that were once part of a territory of Sasanian empire, the Christian lived much as they still do today in Turkey and Persia, tolerated but despised as second-class citizen, rarely persecuted but often harassed and tormented. The Nestorian have suffered a relentless process of iteration of, over, over the centuries. So long as there, there were still um, fire worshippers, conversion still took place. But from the closing years of the 8th century in Mesopotamia and Western Iran, and a little later, the Caspian and Eastern region and um, the Christian uh, maintained themselves only within their own communities, handing down the faith from generation to the next. Hardly any example are known of mass apostasies, but Christians are worn down by incessant, by, um, incessant attacks of varying severity upon their faith or tempted by the prospect of marriage with a Muslim, must have, ab abound must have, sorry, I can't see this one.
must have abandoned their beliefs, but far more numerous, especially in the wilds of um, Ajibin, Kurdistan, and Azerbaijan, were the Christians who stubbornly remained in their humble villages at the mercy of their oppressors. Bloodthirsty Kurdish tribesmen are constantly plundered and raided their villages, and grasping Arab landowners who swindled them out of their, their best or land or simply stole them from them, killing anybody who stood in their way. They were true martyrs for the Christian faith, since they could have put an end to their trials by simply converting to Islam. And if you look at this situation, this is exactly what is happening today. So you've heard about the cities in the um, um, plain of Nineveh or in Karakosh, which was mainly the, the, the big city that was, or the big town that uh, fell in the hands of ISIS. And you heard about uh, Bartolla and Tel Kef. And actually, you know, like it was only in May that I was visited by a priest from Karakosh who came as a scholar through the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. And the British Institute for the Study of Iraq got in touch with us telling us that there is this priest who is a scholar and he might be interested in, you know, in collaborating with what you are doing. He came to us and he told us about, um, uh, about a fresco he discovered that dates back to the 12th century. Um, it's a beautiful mosaic, um, mosaic. I'll show you later the, the pictures. And um, he asked us, could you please come and do something about it? Because it's fading away, I'm old, and no one knows what is going to happen to that mosaic. Could you please come? And we were about, and he said, it is very safe there. We were going to have a whole team uh, to go and study and preserve that uh, jewel that, that we have. And of course, in June, little we knew that in June and July, it is, it's going to be too late. We don't know what happened to that mosaic. It is outside the church, it's not inside the church. Um, and I'm just hoping that ISIS will be you know, like ignoring it and really don't do anything to it because it is, it's an important piece. So this is what we are trying to do in, um, in Aradin. And these are the, ch the, the challenges that are facing uh, um, us. It is not only about keeping the faith, but also that cultural life. Um, which in the end really is enrichment for everyone. Um, if we look at what, the, what ISIS has uh, done and really who the, the real victims are, besides the, um, I mean, I'm going to talk about the manuscripts and artifacts and, and sites that are um, at risk. But really from my visit in Iraq, I was in Iraq in um, early October, and when I was going around uh, taking pictures, really what I saw is that women were the first victims. You have women and children. And I have a few pictures here. And I didn't go and look for women just to take pictures and to show you women. It is honestly wherever I went, there were these tents and you see m women and children. I have very few pictures because of uh, lack of time. But um, why I'm talking about women? Because we've heard about um, uh, Yazidi women taken and Christian, some Christian women as well, taken and uh, sold in the, um, in the market. And in, in order to understand why they are doing that, really, it is we have to understand what is happening to women now. Uh, we have to understand the notion of honor or reputation. The reputation of any family or community depends on the reputation of its women. In other words, the difficult situation most women find themselves in, um, in the Middle East or in Eastern uh, cultures, is not due to the fact that they are weak or not valued. On the contrary, it is because of their infinite value as guarantor of honor and good reputation. The notion of honor becomes, in this case, two-edged sword that can easily turn into a curse or imprison women, limit their freedom, and even cost them their lives. Just to give you an idea, you know, like in the, in, in the Middle East and in Eastern cultures in general, you can have you can build the reputation of any family or community and have 15 heroes who've done these amazing um, uh, deeds, but it takes only one woman to ruin that reputation of that family or the community. So by taking women hostage, the reputation of any community would have been tarnished, and by, the very, by that very fact, the very community they belong to is taken hostage. So when we are taking hostages, um, women, whether they are Yazidis or Christian or other, Actually, what they are doing is not only just targeting that woman, but it is really targeting the whole community. Um, so this is, these are the pictures. I, I went, I was there in October, and what you see, these people are living in these tents. Hopefully now they have more caravans because this is not, uh, they can't live like this in the, in the winter. 
and they have always the cross there. And this is really very beautiful. Uh, when you talk about them, what they have lost, they've lost absolutely everything, absolutely everything. But when you talk, when you ask them, was it really worth it? They say, yes, it was really worth it. And it's not only to be stubborn, you know, again, it's not only, oh, I'm Christian, I'm just going to show them that, you know, this is really worth it. There is something more about it. It is that freedom of religion. It is the freedom that is really very important. And this is when they have the cross there is just to say, I'm still free. I'm still here. Yes, wounded without anything. But you know what? I have my dignity and I still have the freedom to choose whatever I want to be. Is it this one? So these are the tents that this is how people were living. And what you see here, actually, I've heard a lot of about the Yazidis. And to tell you the truth, when I was reading uh, about the Yazidis in Iraq uh, and in England, I was just thinking, why all this fuss about the Yazidis? Till I went and I saw how they were living. The, this picture was taken from a car. We couldn't uh, stop because it was too dangerous. And literally, it was on the highway. And this is where people were sleeping. It is dangerous. It is unsafe. And just to think that someone is forced to live in these tents in the middle of nowhere is inhumane. Um, let's just stop here. Um, so this is what we were talking about, women. And then I'll show you um, the... These are... Um, what I've discovered when I went to, uh, to Iraq is that actually I had family in Karakosh. I didn't know that I had family in Karakosh. I discovered that there is a family. So suddenly you hear about ISIS, and I see that actually I had people who were affected by ISIS. This family, their mother is a cousin, and she has four children. They were uh, well-to-do. Um, they had their own farm. They had their own business. They were building already two more houses for, their, for the two children who were going to finish the university and they were going to get married, and they had canary birds and all the rest of it, because the husband says always, I wish I had my canary birds with me, you know, like, but he could, of course, he couldn't take it with them. So this is a tragedy that you see, it's not only in, like you read about it, but, but you hear it. And one of the boys, he was in the second, in the, at the university, doing uh, studying economics second year, and now he's doing absolutely nothing. We don't know what is going to happen to him. These are, as I said, you know, like I was looking, these are some of the refugees that were in, uh, in my village. I went to visit there. And as you see, really, the, most of them are women. And um, some, you know, like you have some young men there as well. But here are the children and women again as sufferers of, um, of war. And what we are trying to do, in, uh, I'm, I'm t I've taken this picture, really. What I'm embracing here is... This is the last link to a culture that is not going to be there any longer. So what, what ISIS is doing, you know, like, is getting rid of the last link that we have to a culture that lasted for 2,000 years, and now we, are not, we don't know what is going to happen to it. Women, uh, we've heard a lot about the, how fierce uh, ISIS is, uh, how ruthless they were, but not everyone uh, bound to them. And these two nuns were taken hostage by ISIS. One of them is a cousin of mine or my aunt. Uh, they were taken hostage with uh, other two girls. These are the other two girls, and there was a little boy with them. And what happened to them, they were, you know, just to cut a very uh, um, uh, long story short, is that they were taken by ISIS, and they were given the three choices. Convert, pay, or die. And, of course, um, Auntie Artur said, to convert, that's not an option. Uh, to pay, we don't have money. We are nuns, and these are children, orphan children. We don't have any money. And to die, we are very happy to die for our faith. They asked them a few times. They, re they refused. And... Uh, what is really very beautiful is that uh, one day one of the hostages, uh, sorry, one of these um, terrorists came to her and she had her rosary with her and she had the, uh, the crucifix. And he said to her, he started shouting at her that she has to remove. Uh, first they asked them to take off, I mean, to replace their habit with more Islamic um, 
dress or clothes, and they said, our clothes are perfectly decent. You see absolutely nothing, so there's nothing. We are going to die in our clothes. We are not going to change our clothes. So this is what happened. Now she took the, the cross and looked at it, and she said, this symbol, this cross is for me. It's a symbol of love, and it's for me. It is not for you. And he's not, he's not looking at you, and he doesn't like the, the hideous deeds that you are doing. And then she started talking to him, and she said, you know, you cannot kill any person in name of God, because God is in every person, and even in you, even though that you don't see it. And the terrorist started <laughs> looking at himself and said, where is God? Where is God in me? Where is God? And she said, yeah, of course, you cannot see it because of your hideous de deeds. And two days later, that same terrorist started going to them because they were locked in, in a room and asking them if they needed anything. And she said he completely changed after that heated, very heated debate uh, with, uh, with her. So the, the, they were the ones who defeated um, terrorism. These two girls as well, um, of course, what I'm doing here, so this is part of the culture, you know, like of what I'm trying to do is to rec not only to record the stories, but also to video, to take a video of them. Because this is really very important that we record everything for history. Um, culture, Oriental or in like really Aramaic history is oral tradition. We are, we have everything is, nothing is recorded. Most of them is based on oral tradition. And that oral tradition has been handed down from generation to generation. And what is happening now with the generation really that uh, is going in like with my grandmother generation, basically that was the end of it. Because with my generation, we have been affected a lot by the Arabization of of our culture. We haven't lived because they, we, we were kicked out of these villages. Uh, I only can talk about my village that there were two, our house has been destroyed twice. The village has been destroyed twice and they had to go and build it again. Um, this woman, you know, like I, I met again, you know, like I just go and ask women about their stories and she said that she didn't have any story. I thought that she was just living there and I asked her about the sewing machine that she, she had there. And actually there's a whole story behind that sewing machine. Uh, this woman, and what I've discovered actually, the, the problem didn't start with uh, ISIS because in 94 already, um, her family was driven out of Mosul. <clears throat> because, and because there were people who attacked their neighbors and said, Christians are not allowed to stay here. This is Islamic property. You, you don't have the right to stay here. And <clears throat> they had to flee to, to Ankau, which was at that time, you know, like now it's a Christian town, but at that time it was just a village. There was absolutely nothing to it, just to flee for their life. And um, they started, they moved their business to Karakosh. And unfortunately, you know, like ISIS um, has taken Karakosh and they've lost absolutely everything. But what I'm showing here with this lady and the sewing machine is that we are trying. So I hope that we can get that sewing machine because it's important. It's telling us something about the history of that lady and about her family. So what we are trying to do is also to tell history through objects. Objects are very important. We want to keep it in the family. She didn't have any story, but through that object, now we have a full story. We can and you know, we can reconstruct what, what was happening in, in Iraq. These are the two nuns again. <coughs> so what, what else are we doing here? We are going to, to talk about, as I was saying, um, we are talking about women, how to record history through uh, objects, but what we have also is, ne is Aramaic. Aramaic is one of the oldest languages that has been attested for 2,000 years, 4,000 years actually. And with this generation, so this, these are the, la the last generation <coughs> of fluent speakers of Aramaic. It's in my village, they are losing their, their memory. And And what, what is happening as well is that they, they are dying. So it, it was only two months ago that um, 
actually my aunt died who was one of the most um, uh, fluent speakers she has um, the history as I said it's the oral tradition that we are trying to, to save so the focus of the dialects is that they have now lost most of their fluent speakers and only a handful of elderly speakers as you see here are still with us today these speakers are the last bearers and transmitters of a very rich and ancient linguistic, social, and cultural heritage in its most intact form. As one of the few fluent native speakers of uh, one of the dialects in the Indohok, of Sapna dialects, I have set myself the task of locating the handful competent speakers of these dialects, record them, document, and disseminate the results of that research. When we are talking about um, an endangered language, what we are not talking only about the language itself, which is, which is the endangered, but also we are talking about customs, traditions, and equally, which are equally endangered. And uh, because of what is happening, and like the, so many people have now settled in the in the West, that actually we don't think that the that these languages and customs and tradi traditions will survive for more than two generations down. Uh, I can only talk about myself, you know, like there are so many things that we, um, I don't do as my grandmother and mother, mother do. And uh, <coughs> what we are doing with these recordings, so as you see, I have a, a machine in my hands, and what I'm do doing is going around, <coughs> sorry, and covering a wide range of topics and styles. So we are going to record tales, songs, lamentations, nurseries, poems, and also history, culture, and religion, economic status, social structures, and governing and organization of how the villages or towns were, were run. Um, when we are doing something like this, this is another elderly lady. This is the one that I'm, so this is really the generation I'm speaking about. They are all in their late 80s. And for at the time, you know, like at the moment, you know, like with this lady who has died um, a month uh, ago, I have now three native speakers that I can interview. And I'm just hoping, so that old man is one of them, and I'm hoping that they will stay alive till, you know, till November, uh, till February when I'll go and, um, and interview them. So uh, when, when we are doing the recording of uh, a language like uh, Aramaic, which with it is rich and ancient uh, past and present as well, there are a number of crucial um, elements that we have to take into account. As I said, the first decisive component in any documentation is really, and it is beyond any control, <coughs> and demands an immediate action is time. The main challenge facing us at the moment is not only the limited number of competent informants, but also their survival rate. There is a real urgency since we don't know how much longer the identified adult informants will be with us, neither how much longer they will be and communicate their stories and another linguistic treasury they have guarded all these decades. Our informants are quite advanced in years. The second uh, thing is a human component. They have to have trust in you, basically. And um, in order to do for these recordings to be, to be taken in the most natural habitat of spontaneous language use, uh, the informant has to feel that they can trust the interviewer. There is usually some, um, a high rate of dropouts among informants who decline the possibility of being recorded or filmed. And so far, it was because of the informant's past experience they make them suspicious of anything that uh, has to do anything with filming. Or, uh, of course, they were they lived under one of the most brutal dicta dictatorial re regime, and they were reluctant to have anything on record. However, when I went to Iraq now, uh, they fear has been replaced now by trauma. I've asked so many people to start talking about their stories or record their stories, <coughs> and they would say. I'm so sorry, I started, but I couldn't continue. It is just too painful for me to continue writing it. So this is what is happening now. The third component, which is very important, uh, is really is that gender-based. You know, like when, when I was talking to people, whether they are men and women, they, uh, they have their own approach from different perspective, and we have to take that into account. 
uh, before uh, ISIS um, attacked um, Iraq, well, when I was asking them about their personal histories, stories, weddings, you know, like uh, poetry, um, you will see the difference there because <coughs> it's very gender-based, you know, like you have this separation. Man will tell you something about how he they went and asked for the hand of the girl, and and women they will have more uh, practical things. So it is it is very important to collect that data as well. Uh, <coughs> uh, the other things I'll just go through. All right. <coughs> Here. We are going to talk about now codicology and manuscripts because that has been one of the things that ISIS has been very good at, burning all these old manuscripts. And while I was in, uh, in Iraq, I saw this one, which of course you cannot read, it's in Arabic. And it is from 1918. And it's really history repeating itself. It's saying that, um, you know, like he's talking about the, um, the manuscripts that they, they've lost. In 1981, they left Ormia. He said, we've left <clears throat> with thousands of books, everything that we had. Among these things, were, among these books, were uh, very old uh, copies of manuscripts and um, another four written on the, um, on the skin of the deer. Uh, the, they were dated to 200, between 200 and 1,500 uh, so it's, well, that's the date of these manuscripts. And he said they were all lost by, in like, by the hand of the non-believers. And with these copies, we've also uh, lost many um, copies of, this, uh, of the book that he's copying here, except for one copy that we have found with, uh, with one of the priests, and that's why he's copying this, uh, this manuscript. So codicology, this is, this is the type of manuscripts that we are, we are looking at, and this is the, what we are trying to save as well. Um, when I was in Iraq, we went to, um, to, to Erbil, and this is Father Najib, who is showing me, again, it is all, all filmed, the, he's showing me all the manuscripts that he had, because what he's done, he was in Karakosh, he's a Dominican father, literally two hours before the, the, the ISIS arrived, he managed to put everything in, in two trucks, and he drove. Um, and he said that while he was on his way, he saw you know, like people walking, especially the elderly children. And he said, he just asked them, I said, forget about the manuscripts, just get on the truck and I'll, I'll drive you, you know, like to, to Erbil. So he managed to save all these, uh, um, all these manuscripts, but many, you know, like all the big things, you know, like that he couldn't do. And he's showing me what, what he's doing. What, what the problem is that they are left in a very unsafe place you don't have the, uh, the right temperature, hum there is a problem of humidity, and also you know, the, the problem is that if there are thieves and if they know the value of these um, manuscripts, then the, we will be in a big trouble. So if you look here, uh, again, this is all filmed, you have a manuscript that dates back to 1580, 1 to 1690. So, th so these, uh, they are not numbers of the books, but they are years of publication of these manuscripts. So this is what we are trying to do. And this, they are just left there in the shelf in a room without any, um, any protection, basically. Uh, this is the type of things we are trying to, to save as well. And this is the fresco that I told you about. This is the, the, the state that it was. And this is what we are trying to go in June and repair it. Because if you look, it is actually very Western style. We don't know. They think that it dates back to the 12th century. There are no studies. There is no mention of it. And no one knows what that fresco is doing there, especially when you are coming from a region where paintings were not common in churches. That painting that we have there, which is not really great, it is of St. George. That painting was covering this fresco. And when the, the priest who discovered there was some fresco, I don't know if you can see in the corner there, you know, like where it's peeling off, he could trace a, so, a sort of halo. So he asked them to remove that, but instead of removing it and keeping that uh, painting of St. George, well, they've done, they just peeled it off and it's gone. So really what we, what we have now is just that picture and a few other pictures of... Um, so this is the, the, one of the villages that is in Aradin. 
These are now the type of houses that they were after they were destroyed twice. This is the type of houses that you have. This, was, this is now what used to be my grandparents' house, which was full of gardens and as beautiful. And now it is like a small alleyway. You know, you don't recognize it. And it's occupied by someone else. Because what happened, you know, people started building, so they, they gave money without taking into account the cultural, the social um, uh, customs and, uh, you know, everything there. They just built houses, and that this is now someone who is living there. And that replaces this. When I saw this picture, I asked a cousin of mine, what is this picture? These are ruins of what? And they said, and he said, this is the, the, the ruins of our ancestral house. So you see the difference between this and this. And this is now gone. And it is by, just by chance that actually that I've discovered that there is this picture of what they used to say because we, we've heard, you know, like when we were little, about our ancestral house and they used to say that is the path to heaven and it was this huge house. We never had an idea what it was. But this picture shows you. And this is why what we are trying to do is really just go and look for pictures and try to preserve that heritage for the future generation because I have now my nieces and nephews who are born in Belgium and in Canada, and they have absolutely nothing to go back to read about their culture and uh, the history of their family, the history of their village, and the history of their culture. There's absolutely nothing written there. So this, this is what we, and th these are the ruins. As I said, it was um, destroyed twice. Now, we have in that village a church that dates back to the fourth century. So this is not only just about houses, but we have very old churches. And what's happening to this church that dates back to the fourth century? Actually, uh, we found a, a picture of it, as you see there. And this is now the present gate. So without any studies or anything, you know, like they've just renovated, restored it, but actually they've killed the church because this is something, as I said, it's not only that doesn't belong to that church, to that village, it belongs to humanity. This is something from the fourth century. And this is what you will find. It is just left there without any studies, without anything. It is just, we don't know what it is. This is another church that dates back to the sixth century. So this is it. This is now the gate where people go to church. It's still used. And this is the, um, this is the part where that belongs to the sixth century. We know that. Um, this is the gate, the, the original gate, which was there. And if you see uh, something on top of that gate, this is in Aramaic. And what happened? This church was bombed. And that inscription was destroyed and really someone in the village just tried and put to put it together because he said I don't want to lose it he couldn't read it himself he didn't know what it was but he knew that it was something important so he said you know like, I've managed to put everything together but really it is one piece that is missing and this is where we have to be there and preserve it because as I said you know people are trying to do their best but this is what Aradin is trying to preserve for, for, the, for, that, for that village, but also for the future generation and for us. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, it is just to say, you know, this is what I'm trying to do now. This is another picture that I found. It was a hotel. Uh, it is very old, very, um, it is built in the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman times. And when I started talking to people about the importance, you know, just try to find any pictures that you have any um, artifacts that you have and keep them, you know, like just try to write as much as you remember about what you have. So people started coming to me and saying, look, I have this picture, which is the only picture actually left of what they call Khan, you know? So this was like a sort of a hotel where people will go and pass from the Ottoman uh, Empire, uh, Ottoman times. And he, he said, this is the only picture that we have. After that, it was, it was destroyed, so it is gone. Uh, and these, again, you know, like they are all that type of picture. What, what I really like about it, even though, is that they write the date, which dates back to the 1970, and they write the names as well. So, you know, like you have all these pictures where I ask them, could you please write as much information as possible because we are going to, to document all these things and we need as much information as possible. So this is what they are doing. 
Finally, I just want to, uh, this was one, uh, one course that we organized in Cambridge on codicology and uh, manuscripts because we are working closely with, cl with the clergy. They have a very important role in the community and like because of that Ottoman system still of the military, and like it is the religious le leader who is still leading the community. So we, d we decided that we will target the clergy as well and the religious leaders because that is the first way of uh, really achieving what we are trying to achieve. And this was a letter uh, written by um, one of the priests from Lebanon just saying how important it is what we are trying to do and how inspiring it is and that he's going to help other people. So thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Amal. Um, <laughs> we have time for a few questions, um, but I wanted to find out, Amal, um, how much of this has, is even available and accessible now after ISIS, you know, the photographs, the... Uh, the old churches uh, are. The old church is sense? still, yeah. The, the old church is still really. When I started two years ago, you know, like I didn't know that it was going to be ISIS or anything. But I, you know, like I knew that actually we have all that heritage which is unknown, neglected, and needs documenting. So it is not a matter of you know like just going and doing some research or writing a book about this unknown place, but it's how to empower communities. So you know, like as I said, we were going in July, in June, July, to Karakosh to do something about that uh, fresco. Right, right. Now it is too late. And now, you know, like the, the old churches, and there are many other old churches in the north of Iraq, we are trying to really to save. And not only churches, as you see, you know, there are hotels, there are artifacts. In, in Kurdistan. In Kurdistan, Kurdistan in the mm -hmm. north of Iraq. But again, it is a very unstable region. And we are hoping, we are hoping that, you know, Kurdistan at least will stay as stable as possible. Because really that's the, the last vestige, you know, like if, if Kurdistan falls in the hand of, uh, of ISIS. Uh, it is not going to be only a loss, you know, like a huge uh, loss for the Kurds, but really, I mean, culturally speaking, is a very, very interesting, rich cultural and historical place, and mm -hmm. it's going to be a blow you know, like to the whole humanity, basically. I read in the Vatican press in early July that the Orthodox community in Mosul had spirited out the remains, or what they thought were the remains or relics, of Thomas the Apostle mm -hmm. from Mosul. Mm -hmm. And um, they saw ISIS coming, it was like hours before, or days before ISIS arrived in, in on uh, June, uh, well, in July, in declaring the Islamic State. And, and uh, someone had the foresight to do that. Um, the Father Najib, who yeah. you mentioned, I know he was in touch with us mm -hmm. um, as Karakosh was falling. It was frightening because he could hear, he was writing an email to us saying that he could hear uh, the shots outside yeah. and mm -hmm. the shouts of the militants coming closer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he had just heard that the other towns had fallen. So it was, it was terrifying to read this. Um, what happened to those manuscripts that he loaded up? Did he, uh, he, did has he have them abandoned yeah. them? Or? Yeah, no, he has them now in a room. And when I went to him and just to say, and he said, you know, like, we don't know what is going to happen to our bill because it was really at that time, you know, like yes. ISIS was very mm -hmm. close. And he said, I don't know what to do. And what I suggested is that why we don't find a safe place? Because I think that the problem now in Iraq really um, is that what do we do with all that heritage? What do we do with these treasures? Do we keep them in Iraq? with you know, taking the risk that actually mm -hmm. they are going to be looted and destroyed and you know, like no one, or do we have to get them out of Iraq, which means it's going to be a loss for, for the community. And it is a very, very difficult um, question really, but what I was suggesting to them is that we have to find a way of hiding these manuscripts. So we have to have, as I told them, you know, plan B and C because we are mm -hmm. in, a, in a place that you cannot just wait and see how things go. You have to have a plan in, the, in place and to have a hiding place so that if something happens, you have already a team who knows exactly what to do and we have to practice. It is going to be like a sort of a drill. That's what uh, where, yeah, Donnie where, George did yeah. at the head of the Baghdad Museum yeah. when uh, the looters came in after the U.S. Mm -hmm. invasion. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And um, what about digitization? And There was a monastery that yes, had... Father, uh, uh, Columbus Stewart Thousands has been, yeah. of yeah. manuscripts. Yeah. Can you tell yeah. us about that, that um, particular incident? Uh, I, th I think that's, you know, like, 
what Father uh, Colombo has started first in, in Lebanon, he started digitizing these um, uh, manuscripts because that is really a tradition that they started in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken. They started with all the manuscripts, you know, like in, uh, in Austria. And once they covered, you know, like um, the, um, the manuscript that they were available in Europe and they were interested in, like, that, they started, you know, like because of the situation in the Middle East, he decided that he will go to the Middle East and start digitizing them. And thank goodness for that because... Actually, what, I mean, one of the stories that I've heard is that he was in Turkey. He went and digitized, um, I think that it was a gospel that either dated to the 16th century or maybe earlier, and a week later, that copy disappeared. So what we have now is only one digital copy that is available there. We don't have the physical copy. It's not the same, of course, when you have the physical copy, but still, if we are digitizing, I think that is really a very, very important thing. But what we have to try and do now, as I said, you know, like it happened in 1918. It's happening now. These are manuscripts that they are not going to be replaced. I mean, houses, whether they are uh, uh, old, um, you know, like ugly or nice, you know, you can always improve it. But manuscripts, when they are gone, they are gone. You know, like if it dates back to the to the second century, you know, like it is gone. You cannot replace it, basically. Yeah. Any questions? Wait for that. Can you please identify yourself too? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Stephen O'Shauna. I'm the executive director of A Demand for Action. Uh, we, we work on behalf of Assyrian, Chaldean, Syriac issues uh, in Washington, D.C. And thank you both for, for everything you do. Uh, Nina, I was on the phone this morning with Nuri Kino, and he wanted me to say hello to you. Um, so uh, he, he knew I was coming here. Uh, I have a two-part question that sort of ties to, to what both of you were, were, were saying. Um, as far as getting you know, media recognition, you talked about how that was a very slow process. And that's something that we sort of worked, worked on for, for months. Um, and it really wasn't until after sort of, you know, uh, ISIS had already sort of taken over Mosul for weeks that this issue really started taking, uh, getting traction. And I'm kind of curious as to your opinion as to why that is. Um, and also to uh, Dr. Murugi, to what you were saying, um, you know, this, th these, you know, we talk about Iraqi Christians, but th these, these are communities that predated Christianity by thousands of years, the Assyrian uh, people, Chaldean, also called Chaldeans and Syriacs, and why, you know, wh why do you think it is that, that that sort of heritage, that cultural heritage, hasn't been sort of acknowledged as part of this crisis and simply uh, a matter of, of attack on Christianity, when really this is an attack on an indigenous people? Um, so I just would like your insight on that. Well, um, why... Uh, the qu first question, why didn't this uh, assault on these ancient civilizations um, gain greater media traction or traction in the public consciousness um, earlier? And, and I think it's, it took a long time because our political leaders really said nothing until President Obama said something in August about um, the, it, it, the, about the airstrikes, announcing the airstrikes, and said that it has been, ISIS has been particularly brutal against the Christian and Yazidi minorities. It was like something like a seven minute speech. Um, that started, it started to gain traction even within our churches for the first time I noticed at that time in August. Um, I, I am very happy that Pope Francis over the weekend again spoke about this issue and met with the ecumenical patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church in, in Istanbul and and um, drew attention to what was happening in Iraq and the destruction of that civilization and, and calling for the Muslim world to speak out against um, the atrocities of ISIS and to guarantee respect for religious freedom. I think that's very important that the cultural figures like the Pope speak out in that with that kind of specific um, uh, um, directives or asks, if you will. Um, so I think that, that it's been a failure of leadership all around. Did you want to? It's uh, just, I think, that also what happens to these communities, as they say, they've never stayed where they are. They were constantly, you know, like in, in 50 years, from what I've heard from my aunts, they had to flee their villages twice. Everything was destroyed. I remember that there were manuscripts in, in Aradin and I remember a, a, a cousin of mine telling us that actually there was a Gershuni. Gershuni is uh, Arabic text written in Syriac. 
So Christians will write Arabic text. They won't use uh, Arabic letters, but they will write in Syriac uh, letters. There were these manuscripts. Now there isn't one single manuscript or book left in any churches. Not even the records, the baptismal records are there. They are all gone because of what happened. So that is one reason. The other reason is that because of the Arabization of what happened to us, really, our parents and grandparents have just reminded us that we have this important language, they have this important uh, culture that we have to, uh, to preserve. But by the time, you know, like my generation really realized how important it was, it was a little bit late here. So we cannot always blame the West for not doing enough, but sometimes it is, you know, there are sit the situation in the Middle East has been very difficult, and sometimes we have to blame ourselves that we weren't really quick enough or we weren't good enough at presenting really what we have, the richness that we have and the heritage that we have to the world and say, come and save it because it is really worth saving it. Hi, I'm, <coughs> I'm Doug Fife. I'm a senior fellow here at Hudson. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering, have you made an attempt to get any major institutions interested in this extremely important project of preserving what can be preserved from a whole culture? Uh, I'm wondering, are there major universities, for example, that would be interested in you know, providing you with help on how to digitize quickly. I mean, it seems to me that if, you know, if one could organize a, 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 just a bunch of cell phones, mm. people could be going through these books and, and you know, snapping pictures of the, of, of the pages. And uh, are there resources that could be provided by universities or by uh, television channels, like whether it's the History Channel or the or Discovery, or you know, some somebody that would be interested in uh, in taking this on as a project. And the other question I have is, when you talk about preserving a culture, you mentioned all the that there are all these different aspects of culture, uh, from lullabies to life cycle events to architecture to politics. Do you have any models that you're using where other people racing against time to save a culture have decided that here's, here's what we need to focus on, here are the priorities, and, and you know, are, you, are you doing this basically, are you improvising, or is there some model that you can base your work on uh, that, you know, where people have learned lessons in the past? Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is a very important question, and uh, really, we, we are working with the, with institutions. You know, we are working very closely with the University of Cambridge. We are working with the Hill Museum. Uh, we are working with different faculties. We are even working with uh, code ecology, for example. What we are trying to do is just to start a course on code ecology for people in the Middle East. What we are trying to do in Aradin is not just to start any project. You know, like it's not a sort of collaborative project or just any research project. What we are trying to do is to empower these communities and help them while we are doing projects and while we are helping to um, preserve their cultural heritage, that we train them because they are the only ones who can preserve it. You know, like we can do so much, but the, in fact, really, they, have the, they are the ones who have to say, yes, we find this is important. And as, a sh as I have shown you, know, like with that image, you know, like of what was destroyed and put together by someone who didn't even could read what it was written, you know, like in, in Syriac, but he, he realized that actually this is really important. So we have to be there to help them to do it more professionally, but at the same time, I think that what we are trying to do is to empower people, train them. So what we are, what we are trying to do, in the beginning, um, I was thinking of um, giving grants. What we are trying to do is really to, fund, uh, to fundraise so that we can give grants to students to come and study here. One of the, of the things, not just to come and study here, because there are many students who can come and study here, we want to train these people in being the bridge between cultures. They have to be open-minded, they have to be curious, inquisitive, and they know that they are there to, to make some change to the community and also, as I said, you know, to be that bridge between the East and the West. This is very, very important. It's a cultural dialogue that we are looking for. So yes, we are working with universities. Uh, as you know, some universities really, they are thinking of, you know, like it's 
they have, I mean, universities work with their own way and they have their own limits. And what we are trying to do is just to find a way that we can involve these universities, but at the same time, we can involve people from the community. So it is not just, as I said, you know, going there and doing projects, but really involving these people. So I, I hope, I don't know if that answers your question. There's a question right there. It also occurs to me that um, someone like the Green family, who's, uh, who are the Hobby Lobby people who started a Bible museum, mm. um, have been collecting manuscripts and um, artifacts from the ancient world might be interested in some of them. Yes, yes, because really, as I said, you know, like it's just making one, when I went to, to my village and started talking to people about the importance, suddenly they started realizing the importance of the pictures that they have because mm -hmm. the first time I went to see my cousin and he said, oh yeah, just look at the, at the old pile there, all these pictures. And I was sure that his son was going just to throw them and thinking, what are all these old pictures? Mm -hmm. You know, just get rid of them because I'm, I'm leaving. But now, what is happening really that he's aware of the value of what he's happening of what mm -hmm. and he took his son everywhere his son is 12 years and he took his son everywhere with him and he was listening so mm -hmm. this is how you do this is how you educate yeah. yeah community yeah yes sir hi my name is alan mendelson i'm a lawyer here in washington uh we all regard very highly your efforts to preserve the culture of the community um, but it seems to me that you should have been on notice of what was going on after all, you had the Muslim Brotherhood that almost destroyed the Coptic Church in Egypt. If it hadn't been for Mr. Sisi, uh, there might be no longer any cops there. And that whole religion and that whole history could have been wiped out there. So why weren't you on notice that this could happen just as easily in Iraq? Were you on notice? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you oh, were working two years ago. Yes, yeah, two years Four ago years we started, ago. yeah, 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 we started. I'll, I'll tell you something, actually when I was 14 years old, my grandmother who was, um, who was not, I mean, she was very cultured, but she didn't have any, any studies. When I was 14, she realized that, oh, my granddaughters are not, they don't know much about our culture. Uh, even our names are Arabic, because what happened, you know, in the time of my father, they couldn't find any job because they had Christian names. So we all started, uh, you know, getting Arabic names, while, you know, like Elisha and Marogi is very Aramaic name. And my grandmother even gave, you know, like the, her youngest son, she gave him a name, or someone gave him a name, an Arabic name, because they didn't know. I mean, my grandmother didn't speak Arabic. She only spoke, uh, spoke Aramaic. She's never managed to pronounce the name of her own son, because in Aramaic, we don't have the letter ha, and she would always say, instead of Hikmet, she would always call him Hikmet. So she never managed, you know. But she realized that actually my granddaughters don't get, you know, like the, uh, they don't know their culture, they don't know their history. And she was very worried about the type of history that we were studying in the 80s. And she started telling me, you know, like, and she gave, she asked me, uh, she was dictating, she asked me to record what she was dictating when I was 14. And I remember very well, when I was leaving Iraq, I had that, uh, notebook in my hand and looking at it and say, shall I take it with me, yes or no? And unfortunately, you know, like when you are a teenager, you know, um, it was me, I just decided, well, I leave it now, you know, behind with my family and we'll see. Every time I think of it, really, I want to kick myself, you know, like a hundred times, but I think that was, you know, she started something, she sown the seed, and this is what I'm trying to do. Yes, it took time. But yeah, we are there, it is never late. It is never late and we are trying to do, we, we are racing against time. As I said, you know, like all these people are dying out. We, we have very little time. I have three, pe three people I can still interview because they are first hand information. All the rest will be second hand information and third hand information. But yes, we are racing against time. But I think that one thing that these terrorists or these people uh, won't be able to rob us of is that hope. We still have that hope, we, st we are still going to do it. And as I said, you know, like, if you look at these, you know, like I, I've shown you uh, uh, some pictures of women, they really said no to these terrorists, terrifying terrorists. And this is what we are trying to do again with Aradin. Yes, it's only two years ago, and we cannot compete with, uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood. But what we are going to say is that Muslim Brotherhood won't have the last word. We are there. But on that hopeful note, thank you very much, Amal.